Okay, sounds good, Greg. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Um, hope you're having a great day. Hope it's been a good week. And I want to welcome all of you uh, to today's meeting and call to order the sixth meeting of our Family Caregiver Advisory Council. Again, so grateful for um, the fellow council members and our colleagues at the National Academy for State Health Policy and so many other amazing partners in this work. And I extend to you my very warm welcome and again, gratitude that you are joining us today. Thank you so very much. And of course, I also want to acknowledge the members of the public who are with us today. Uh, certainly, I've been pleased like all of you to see the level of interest in these meetings and in the work uh, that we're doing. And I want you to know that uh, we certainly as public members really value your comments and your input throughout the meeting. So thank you. And again, keep that uh, information coming to us. Um, we, uh, are just so excited about uh, today's meeting. And, and again, there's just a lot that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're uh, really, uh, I think, um, in a position to be very proud of all that we've accomplished. And, you know, I want to start off and just uh, recognize or acknowledge, if you will, that um, we're celebrating National Family Caregivers Month for the month of November. So, of course, it is very timely uh, that we're holding a meeting of the family Caregiver Advisory Council during this month as well. And in looking at our agenda, and as I've uh, been briefed by my team here at ACL, Greg, Lori, Sarah, and others, I just want to point out um, the importance of this event. As you'll see when Greg goes over the agenda here in just a couple of minutes, uh, today's meeting really will see this council vote to adopt a slate of recommendations for inclusion in the initial report to Congress. That is so very exciting, and it's really an incredible marker of the progress of our work. So, as you know, uh, when we first met back in August of 2019, which um, just seems like yesterday, I shared with you my passion for this work and how improving supports for family caregivers has been so central to my work here at ACL. As I look back on our work and all the progress we've made, I can't help but be extraordinarily thankful for the progress we've made. And, of course, we are today um, at a pivotal point and the direction that we're heading with our work is just outstanding. Our success so far, of course, would not be possible without the incredible talent and dedication of the members of this council. Uh, what an incredible group of individuals you are. And again, we're just so honored to work uh, with you and walk alongside you in this journey. Your commitment to improving the lives of family caregivers is remarkable. Each time we've gathered together like this, I'm so struck by your creativity and drive to do what's best and what's right for millions of family caregivers in our country. As I think a bit more, I'm also deeply grateful for the collaborative efforts of our many partners in this effort. Now, first and foremost, the John A. Hartford Foundation's foresight and generosity that enabled our colleagues at the National Academy for State Health Policy to take a key role in helping ACL move ahead with this work. Without that partnership, I dare say we would not be where we are today and in a position to advance a slate of recommendations so quickly. Among our other partners in this work, of course, has been the National Alliance for Caregiving, uh, who you'll be hearing from here just a little bit on the agenda. And they've done such an amazing job of helping us infuse the voices of family caregivers into our work and our focus. And also, we've been so fortunate to have the expertise of Community Catalyst, UMass Boston, uh, UMass Boston and Advancing States. Um, all three have helped us really understand and make meaningful use of the information that we've gathered through listening sessions of family caregivers and, of course, our request for information effort. Uh, your work has really been so integral in ensuring the voices of family caregivers are also present in our work. But I guess if there's one thing I'm most grateful for in all of this work is, of course, the honor that we have to help support the 50 million family caregivers across this country, who we know day in and day out, uh, give all that they can to support those they love and help them remain independent and in their homes and communities. And when you're the administrator for the administration for community living, uh, that really hits the bullseye. Uh, I don't think our work could be more important than it is around these conversations. So family caregivers are who we work for and on behalf of. Uh, family caregivers are the cornerstone of our long-term services systems, and they are the heart and soul of our nation and a true representation of the very best in all of us. Supporting families and family caregivers, of course, is at the heart of our mission here at ACL and our vision. Uh, that makes the work that we're doing here all the more important and meaningful. So, 
with that, I'm going to go ahead and just turn um, the agenda over to Cheryl Thompson, who, of course, is going to take roll call and we'll proceed on with the meeting. So. Again, thank you so very much to all of you, both uh, council members and the public who are participating today and to Greg and the team. Just keep doing the great work that you're doing. I'm so proud of all of you. Cheryl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And we'll start off with our chair, Lance Robertson. I am, pre I am present. Thank you. And then our co-chairs, Casey Shillam. Present. Alan Stevens. Present. Nancy Murray. Present. And then our non-federal members, Ben Bledsoe. Present. Joe Caldwell. Present. Diane Caradu. Present. James Cheely. Gisela Dolan. Brenda Gallant. Here. Catherine Alicia Georges. Here. Rhonda Montgomery. Here. James Martha. Here. Deborah Stone Walls. Here. Teresa Tanus. Thank you. Carol Zerniel. Here. And then our federal members. Elizabeth Darling is not able to attend, but we have an alternate, Liliana Hernandez. Dr. Linda Davis. Here. Bruce Fink. Present. Melissa Gerald. Melissa Harris, or alternate Jody Sumaraki, Helen Lamont. I'm present. Thank you. Tamara Mays, Lisa McGuire is unable to attend, but we have alternate Dr. Christopher Taylor. And Cheryl, I'm here. This is Melissa Gerald. I was muted, I just realized. Oh, oh no problem. Sorry. Thank you very much. You're okay, Dr. Christopher Taylor. Jan Newsom. Katie O'Callaghan or alternate Diane Mitchell. Lisa Schifferly. Here. Thank you. Rosemary Payne is unable to attend today. Mark Vafiades. And Joan Weiss. Cheryl, this is Chris Taylor from CDC. I am present. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And did any any members join after I began roll call? Okay, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> and let me also extend my welcome uh, to the members of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council. Um, as well as those members of the public that we have <clears throat> tuning in to watch the meeting today. Uh, before we get before we get started, um, I want to just run through the agenda um, today. <clears throat> it is um, a very accomplishment-packed agenda. This uh, meeting, as Lance alluded to, will be um, rather pivotal in the in the 
history of the, the Family Caregiving Advisory Council um, in that we are going to be voting, or you all are going to be voting to adopt a slate of recommendations uh, that will be included in your initial report to Congress. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, one, but before we get to that, um, one item that we do have is a presentation from our partners at the National Alliance for Caregiving. One of the goals of ACL as well as the Family Caregiving Advisory Council um, from the very beginning has been to ensure that we are honoring and including the voices of family caregivers in the work that we do and in every step of, of our way towards the development of a national caregiving strategy. And through the support of the John A. Hartford Foundation and their grant to the National Academy for State Health Policy, um, they were able to engage with the National Alliance for Caregiving to actually um, bring the voices of caregivers to the forefront through a series of interview and interviews and the development of a, of a series of family caregiver stories. And Mike Whitkey is going to be here to talk with us about those that effort. And then right after that, um, we are going to then move into the business portion of our meeting, which will, which will really take up um, the vast majority of today's meeting, which will be the presentation and voting um, by the non-federal members of the council uh, to adopt a slate of recommendations um, for the five goals that they um, adopted um, earlier this year. And then at the end of the meeting today, we're going to be um, going over our um, ACL and NASHP's immediate plans for the work of the council that will get us through March of approximately March of 2021. So by way of just providing a little bit of an update on ACL uh, and what we have going on here, <clears throat> since our last full meeting, we have not, um, we've not been idle. Uh, we have been incredibly busy. I can tell folks that the um, the work on the initial report to Congress continues um, and it's moving along quite well. Um, th many thanks again to our federal partners for your very close collaboration and cooperation with my staff um, in completing the inventory of federal programs and initiatives. Um, I know that there are still a few outstanding um, <clears throat> documents that you all are reviewing, but that process has come along quite nicely, and I think the information that we'll be able to pull together um, on the federal level for this report will be quite impressive. So thank you um, to those of you who have completed your review of your of your narrative portions, and um, in advance, thank you to the rest of you who are working to get those to us. Um, Sarah Markell from my team continues to be um, very active in her role as the lead writer. Um, and we are going to begin moving um, sections of this report through some internal review here at ACL and then ultimately um, to our council um, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Other activities that we have going on, of course, November is um, National Family Caregivers Month. Um, <clears throat> ACL has been working closely with the National Alliance for Caregiving to promote their um, uh, tweeting and presenting of a, of a select group of their caregiver stories that will be featured in our report, and you'll see a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, early next week, Lance will be publishing a blog uh, for Caregivers Month, which I think will feature a lot of our work that we've done so far on the council, um, and so keep your eyes open for that. Um, that's pretty much what we have going on here um, related to updates. Wendy um, at Nashby, did you have anything in particular um, that you wanted to add to the updates? Sure, just three also quick updates. One is the listening sessions. So Community Catalyst, our partner, will be hosting listening sessions during the first two weeks of December with organizations to give you input on a national strategy. So council members, if you can, please RSVP if you plan to listen in. I know we've heard from a number of you, so this is just a very friendly reminder for those of you who we haven't heard from yet. Um, the second update is, is that my organization, Nashby, just published a paper called Medicaid Supports for Family Caregivers, which will also inform this report to Congress. So um, council members and um, the public who's li listening in right now, uh, please read this important paper. And once again, it's Nashby's paper entitled Medicaid Supports for Family Caregivers. And then finally, for um, National Family Caregivers Month, uh, my organization, Nashby, will be hosting a Twitter chat tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern uh, time. 
So please join us, including the public. Please join us and you'll use hashtag raise chat to raise awareness and discussion on family caregiving. And with that, back to you, Greg. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, so definitely lots going on uh, for uh, Family Caregivers Month. I think it's particularly um, exciting this month given the progress that we've made um, with, with you all as the Family Caregiving Advisory Council. Um, and, and we just really appreciate the momentum. Uh, before we move into the main portion of the agenda and we hear from Mike Whitkey at the National Alliance for Caregiving, um, are there any um, do many members of the council have any questions or comments or updates that they would like to provide? Okay, well, hearing none, then we will go ahead and move um, to the, the next um, portion of our agenda. Um, many of you may know Mike, uh, Mike Whitkey. He's the Senior Director for Public Policy and Advocacy at the National Alliance for Caregiving. Um, NASHP and ACL engaged with them, with, with NAC, several months ago to uh, look at the possibility of um, really bringing the voice of caregivers to the forefront in a very real and meaningful way. Um, and then presenting those voices and those stories and perspectives um, in the initial report to Congress that's developing. Um, and so it, it's really fitting, I think, for Family Caregivers Month um, to be able to have Mike talk about their work and to begin to just show you um, some of what will be presented in this report. But it's, I think it's also a wonderful way um, to really honor caregivers this month in, in a real and meaningful way. So Mike, um, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to take council members through the work that you all have done and present us with some of the some of the great outcomes of that. Mike. Thank you, Greg and Wendy and everybody for having me here today. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to represent the National Alliance for Caregiving. Um, again, and if you want to move to the the next slide, um, we can get started here. Um, so my role, at my, again, my name is Mike Wickey. I'm the Senior Director for Public Policy public policy and advocacy at the National Alliance for Caregiving. So I work a lot with policymakers here in DC and around the country. And we also have a grassroots network of caregivers um, who are, well, caregivers and people who work with caregivers from all over the country, from different states um, and localities. And that's really how we were able to draw from um, our network to bring some caregiver voices into this project. So what I'm here to do today is to shed some light on the work that we at, at uh, National Alliance for Caregiving have been doing to bring the caregiver voice Voice into the work of the Rays Council through a series of vignettes um, highlighting the lived experiences of caregivers across the United States. You can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about our organization. I'm sure many of you are familiar, um, but I wanted to just sum it up through our mission and our vision, which we live every day. Um, you can see it here on the screen and the work that the Rays Council is doing is perfectly in line with NAC's vision to offer a road that, that offers a roadmap to see how we can create a society that recognizes, assists, includes, supports, and engages family caregivers in, in various aspects where they're impacted by their role as caregiver. And we also see this work in, our, in line with our mission to partner with stakeholders such as ACL and the Rays Council and the National Academy for State Health Policy and Johnny Hartford Foundation, for example, to reach into our network and engage the very group we're all working to address um, through this work and through other work that you are all involved in. You can go to the next slide. So my goal here today in this presentation is to tell you a little bit about this project and how we went about collecting the details um, that went in each of these caregiver vignettes. And then we'll have a chance to get a glimpse of some of the caregivers that we featured and how will this work will evolve into 2021. You can go to the next slide. So first, as we set out to collect these stories, we wanted to make sure that the caregivers featured reflected the wide diversity of caregivers, including backgrounds that represented racial and ethnic gender diversity, as well as various age ranges of caregivers, those who are from rural and urban areas and all in between, in addition to caregivers of people with various conditions. Um, so many different types of lived experiences and so many different types of caregivers who, you know, we, we, we want to draw out in through the course of this project so that people really get a sense of the various types of caregivers that are out there. So 
Next, we drew from a selection of caregivers in our network to do some and, and who, who we knew actually had some level of knowledge about the policy and advocacy landscape so that they could speak to an audience of policymakers. Not everybody has that sort of um, perspective and understanding. Some of them are caregivers who didn't even realize that the work of the RAISE Council was happening, but some of them actually have had a chance to be involved in advocacy through organizations um, that represent mostly the conditions of the person they're caring for, such as the Alzheimer's Association, um, the ARC, and uh, you know the different aging disability um, and beyond um, uh, organizations that are are working to serve um, also they're also playing in a role into to drawing out the um, needs and paying and pay some attention to the the ways that we can bring caregivers into the healthcare system and support them through their financial security challenges and beyond. A lot of the things that you guys are all talking about in your recommendations. Um, and so similar to an experience we're all familiar with, um, COVID-19 came into our lives during the course of this project, so we had to adjust to a virtual world. We were originally planning to um, get make sure that, that all these caregivers had an opportunity to get high quality, high resolution photos that can be included along with their stories um, to be included in the first report. And, 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 and so those caregivers who did not have um, you know, a, a ready-made high quality photo that could be used we had planned on um, sending photographers to their houses so that we can get some good some good quality photos. Obviously, the the population that we're talking about here today is the most vulnerable out there to to the virus. So we we were not comfortable at that point sending any photographers into any people's homes to try and you know help prevent the the spread of the the virus. Um, so we had to get a little bit creative, and and that's where Zoom came into our lives. Um, we interviewed caregivers. Um, through a through the virtual network um, that allowed us to not only be able to to record their stories and to record um, the interview that we did with them, so we're able to draw from that that interview to be able to to collect the stories and to collect the details and make sure that we are representing their stories accurately. But also, we were able to capture um, some still photos throughout. Um, the course of the interview that we could turn into some high resolution, high quality photos that will be featured in the report will also in a way of in, in and of itself reflect the, the world that we're all living in right now during this pandemic with everybody being isolated in their homes. Um, so we interviewed caregivers to the um, to summarize their stories and we needed to make sure that we that we fit those stories within a framework that fit within this report. So, um, you know, we just sort of took some of the, the snippets and the highlights of the different um, unique aspects to each caregiver that, um, you know, a lot of them have a lot of the caregivers have similarities in their stories, but we wanted to make sure that we were highlighting what was unique about each individual story in the summary that ultimately worked out to be the vignettes. And we also worked within a network of policy leaders to give them a heads up that this report is coming out and will feature caregivers of the populations they represent and they're working to serve. So as a way to raise the awareness of the of the work that's going to be coming out for this first report and, and to draw attention to the recommendations that are going to be um, produced along with it. And uh, lastly, we we featured five of those highlighted through a social media, the five caregivers that we featured um, throughout this whole process are going to be are highlighted in the month of Na National Family Caregiver Month through a social media campaign that's currently taking place. Um, we all sort of heard from the beginning of the, the conversation here today that that this is a perfect time of, of the year to be able to start highlighting some of those those stories and to draw attention to the work of the Race Council through a social media campaign. And I'd just like to say a big thank you and acknowledgement to those who made this work possible, um, working with ACL, the Race Council, Nashby, and Johnny Hart for foundation especially um, we've all worked really closely together to make sure that the work that we were doing here collecting these stories and these vignettes fit within what the what could really be helpful and useful for the race council in in um, highlighting the patients and supporting them as they are published um, in the first report so you can go to the next slide so this is um, the this is the represent this is the uh, sort of um, image that I pulled together that represents the National Alliance for Caregiving National Alliance for Caregiving's network. Um, a lot of these caregivers were drawn from our advocacy collaborative. So we have, like I said earlier, several caregivers and several professional. Um, uh, 
folks who are working with caregivers across the country. And so we were able to, to really get a good cross section of caregivers um, sort of meeting all the different criteria we were looking for to be able to make sure we weren't just telling the same story over and over, but we had various um, and, and, and unique uh, and, and a diverse range of stories that could be told. Um, so that's that's a little bit about how we were able to go about the process of grabbing um, the, those who we were gonna be able to feature and we were gonna be able to interview during this process. You can go to the next slide. So for each caregiver that we interviewed, some of the questions were a little bit different, um, but we kind of followed a similar theme that you can see here um, during in this, in this uh, on the bullet points here, um, they we asked we started by asking a little bit about the person the, the 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 care recipient, the person the caregiver was caring for, what kind of condition that they had, what types of care that they they required, um, how how um, long they've needed care for, all those kinds of different um, details to really get a good understanding of who they were caring for. But then we also turned the questions over to learn a little bit more about the caregiver. What's their lived experience? What kind of, um, you know, how has their life changed as a result of the caregiving experience? Um, what kinds of challenges and hurdles they experience during this process? And then we asked them um, what would have helped if they had a, a, a more robust infrastructure of support around them um, to really get a good sense of what, you know, from a lay perspective, what would have been helpful to them, not only in, in supporting them in their role, but also um, for those that they're caring for. And lastly, we wanted to ask them, you know, very targeted and specifically, what, what do you think policy is Policymakers and society should know about your experience. Um, how would you, if you were sitting, a lot of the times we frame the question, if you were sitting in front of a member of Congress, the person that was elected to represent you, and they asked you what they should know about your experience, what would you tell them? Um, you know, a, a really interesting process to go through. Um, and, and a lot of them have really great insight to be able to bring towards um, this process. A lot of them were able to get very specific in their answers, and some of them really had no idea that, that people were even looking to, to try and create such a framework, and, and they were very pleased to see that um, you know, people were asking them about what it is that they needed um, and, and to, better, to better support them in this role. You can go to the next slide. So this gives you um, a, a snapshot of, of those caregivers that we interviewed throughout this process. Again, really trying to reflect a broad diversity of caregivers that we um, that we know exist across the country. Um, males, females, people from different cultural backgrounds, uh, people who are are you know living out in in rural parts of the country where supports aren't very robust. People who are living in more um, urban parts of the country where there actually are some some supports, but maybe um, there could be some improvement. And when we when we captured these these um, images, we had them professionally designed to go along with. Um, the brand colors and the brand imaging that, that went along with the Rays Council's logo. So you can see that blue that, and the stars that are reflected um, in the name banner there, so that this can really go in nicely to the report and look and look professional. Um, we we just took their first names so we can so we can establish some level a level of anonymity for those caregivers um, to respect their their so those boundaries. Um, we didn't actually pro provide any details personal details other than the first name of the caregiver alone. Um, we were contemplating changing their names, but some of them felt like that was a little bit odd, and they were happy with with just keeping their first name included. Um, and so we also put under their first name um, the location of where they're where they're from so that you can get a sense of really how that this is a representative group from across the country um, the other thing that we wanted to do as we are capturing these videos was sort of get a mixture of some of the or the, these pictures um, get a mixture of some caregivers who were you know kind of just providing a smile like the, as if we were to take a, a photo of them um, but some of the the pictures also were to reflect the, them in the process of telling their story so you kind of get a mixture there between some of those who those caregivers who were sort of mid mid sentence expressing the emotion they were feeling, um, and then some of the caregivers who who had um, you know some some points within the photos within the videos that we we collected for this uh, or through this interview process um, that that showed them kind of you know smiling and and, and looking nice. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
So this is the these are the rest of the caregivers that we that we interviewed. Um, it was I believe 27 in total that we ended up getting um, all together. We were starting the process to collect about 10 to 20, and once we got to about 20, we realized that we had so many different types of stories that um, came and caregivers that came back to us that that weren't already reflected in the in the original amount of of stories we collected. So we expanded it to make sure that we had you know a broad range of caregivers and 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 experiences. Um, as I look at these pictures, I'm I'm reflecting on you know how each one of these these interviews were were incredibly powerful. Um, you know, when you start to ask them about the the experience they're going through, they're really eager to talk about how this how this has had an impact on their life, um, and and awesome. And also, there was a lot of expression of joy and happiness that people were very encouraged that they were able to be there for their family members. As challenging as the experience was, there really was a bit of of humor and um, and and liveliness that came through in a lot of these interviews. And it was just such a great experience to be able to go through and talk to these people um, one on one individually. Um, and so you can go to the next slide here. Um, the this is a picture of the uh, various um, caregivers that we featured through the, and are featuring throughout National Family Caregiver Month. We had their pictures um, again, sort of professionally designed within a graphic that took a quote from their story to um, you know let them speak through their own words. Um, we we produced about 15 in total, so we we shared five throughout this month, and we have 10 more ready to go that we can share to, as a way to highlight um, when the report comes out and to be able to keep the the the, the conversation going throughout next year. Um, the other part about the um, collecting these these vignettes and these stories and these quotes um, is that each of these interviews lasted about 30 minutes in length, um, so we really were able to get a, a lot of different types of information that um, that that help kind of tell this story in a nuanced way. Um, not only does the, the do the social media posts that come out um, go with are we are we highlighting these photos and these quotes, but we also have little snippets um, that that of language that actually came from the vignettes that people are able to share with the social media posts that they are um, promoting through throughout the month. So you can go to the next slide. So this work um, we plan to take into next year by hosting um, these the the full vignettes onto the national um, the National Alliance for Caregiving and the National Academy for State Health Policy website um, through the resource and dissemination page for the Raise Council because I'm sure that as the final wording is pared down to be able to fit within this large report that's going to be coming out um, that th there may be just um, a shorter version of the vignettes that we ultimately drafted to go along with this published document. Uh, but we wanted to have a place for people to be able to go, to be able to read the whole story, to be able to, to, to get the responses to all the different questions that we asked. Um, and and to, to be able to look a little bit more into the into the um, insights that were provided if they're so interested in doing so. Um, and we, we we wanted to we also throughout this process are making sure that and we're going to continue to do so throughout next year that each of these vignettes connects to the raise council recommendations. So when we have you know a unique aspect of one caregiver story that really highlights one of the specific recommendations that you all have highlighted, we can say you know here is this caregiver, here's their experience, and this specific recommendation or these set of recommendations would really speak to um, a way that can support them and address the concerns and needs that they have brought up during during the, our process of collecting their stories. Um, and also, as I mentioned, you know, as we started the, the interviews, um, we weren't really sure exactly how how the caregivers were going to, um, you know, respond to some of the questions we actually ended up um, we, we expected that each of the interviews would only take about 15 minutes, but once you got them going, once you really started to get a rapport built with the caregivers and ask them about themselves, they really had a lot to say. Um, so each of the interviews ended up being, like I said, about 30 minutes long. So we felt like it was a really, really great opportunity since we recorded all of them to be able to, to not only have the videos and have the, the, the vignettes that were sort of parsed down into a smaller word count, but, uh, but take each of the, the caregivers 
um, the, the, the videos that we collected and edit them down in a way that we can actually share these videos, um, you know, as a part of disseminating the work of the Raise Council and, and beyond um, into like one to two minutes length clips that can be shared on social media, for example. Um, they, we can really get kind of creative in terms of how we're able to, to, to bring their, 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 life, their story and their voice to life by having them tell their own story um, in a way that's, that's kind of um, a little bit more fast paced, that's, that's professionally edited, that includes a little bit of B-roll and some narration and allows for the dots to be connected so that you're not having to, to sit down and watch a, a full 30 minute video where um, you, know, you, you kind of get the ums and the uhs and the things like that taking out. Um, and and uh, we're also going to to do sort of like a longer compilation that will probably be about five to seven minutes uh, seven minutes long that really tells the, the 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 collective story of these caregivers and we'll be able to use the that video um, for any sort of um, activities that we do to promote the recommendations with the, with policymakers. Um, and that's one of the things that we plan to do next year is when the report is ready to come out and the recommendations are available, that we get these recommendations and, and, and the whole body of, of work that you all, all have done in front of policymakers um, so that they can not only be aware of this work, but also get a good understanding of the roadmap of how you know, we're, we're trying to, to reach a, a society that recognizes and values them and includes them a little bit more um, than, than currently is happening. Um, and we're going to do a couple of listening sessions also where, where we draw from the, some of the caregivers that we interviewed throughout this process and have them um, react to, to some of the recommendations to speak a little bit more in detail about how, you know, the, the um, work that this council is doing is, is reflective and can really help. Um, you know, make make life better for not only them if they happen to be in the caregiving experience still, um, but also caregivers into the future. Um, one of the caregivers that we interviewed throughout this process, you know, it's a dynamic experience. One of the caregivers um, actually, um, his, the, who was caring for his wife, um, his wife passed away during the experience. And so, you know, it, it really highlights the, um, the, the dynamic and the ongoing and lived experience that these caregivers are not in a static state, that they're really going through something that evolves and changes over time. And so we wanna make sure that we're able to bring their voice as much as we can into the work that your work that you're doing and, and, and also share it with um, those who will be responsible for implementing um, the, the good work that has, has come out of this whole process. Process. So um, you can go to the next slide. So that's a that's really a summary of the the process that we went through. Um, an example of the caregivers that were that we were able to to feature throughout this process. Uh, we look forward to to hearing any sort of feedback from all of you as as you get a chance to look through the vignettes, um, as you get a chance to you know vote and finalize on your recommendations that you'll be doing here in the next little while. I'm sure. Um, and and we, we look forward to continue to work with you throughout um, this as this process evolves into the new year. So so thank you for having me today. Um, happy to answer any questions and take care. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, council members, any comments or questions for um, Mike Whitkey? Mike, um, James, I, yeah, we can't hear you. Yeah, I just wanted to commend you, Mike. It's amazing work. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was very powerful, and, and it was an honor to do it. Hi, this is Deborah from um, Maui, Hawaii. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I was very impressed with um, uh, your intentions and capturing people in the various uh, phases of caregiving, um, I think it's going to be very effective. So thank you for your work. I appreciate that and thank you for your work too. Thank you, Mike. Uh, one of the very interesting things um, that happened when, when Mike um, shared just the printed versions of the draft vignettes, um, as, as Wendy and, and Sarah Markell and I began to go over them and read through the, the amazing material, we very, very quickly began to see how without the caregivers knowing the recommendations that you all are going to be considering and voting on today, most if not all of these vignettes speak to one or more of these recommendations. And so 
I say that to say that I think their experiences validate and will confirm the recommendations that, that you all are, are voting to put forward today, um, and they're so beautifully connected. And it's also was interesting to see that, you know, that, that for, for many of these caregivers, many of these different areas that you all are thinking about apply to them. So it is truly a multifaceted um, experience for family caregivers, as we, as we all know. So, Mike, thank you again so much. Um, it's been great working with you, and we look forward to continuing to work with you guys, not only for the rest of Caregivers Month, but as we move into next year and we get this report out. Yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you all as well. This is great work that you're doing. Thank you again for, um, you know, all the time and effort you all have put into this process. I know it's not easy to to try and take, you know, per, very personal lived experiences and and translate it into a document that would, um, you know, be able to speak to the a challenging policy landscape that we're all that we're all going through um, and have been. And I think that this is going to be a tremendous effort in helping further establish and cement the roadmap that allows us to really, um, you know, express and and um, and and highlight the the various ways that we're able to address some of these challenges in in real concrete ways. So thank you again, and I appreciate being here today. Great. So thank you. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, and that's great because we have a lot to cover. Um, and so we're going to move on to the next portion of our agenda, which is the. Um, the council's presentation um, of the recommendations and, and your votes to, to adopt them. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to provide a little bit of context and reminder for our council members, but also um, we have about 112 members of the public tuned in to watch. So I just want to kind of ground the next hour and a half or so um, in a little bit of history and, and, and context. Um, so for the council members, you know, over the past several months, um, you all have been working both in public meetings like this of the full council as well as your subcommittees. You've been working diligently to craft a set of, of recommendations that would be moved forward um, and ultimately serve as the basis for the national caregiving strategy. And each of these recommendations that you all are going to be presenting and considering today have been through multiple iterations and revisions over the course of your work. Um, and really, you know, we think that at this point, what we're going to be, what you all will be presenting and discussing today re reflects the Council's best thinking um, over these past months of deliberation and analysis of the information that we, you all have collected from a variety of resources, many of those um, opportunities have come from presentations at full meetings like this. But I first want to remind everyone, and that includes the council members, but also those of you in the public, um, of just a few key things um, to keep in mind as we go through this portion of our agenda. So first is that the recommendations that um, you will hopefully adopt today are likely just the first um, in a series of recommendations that are going to grow and evolve over time. Um, over the months and years to come. Uh, in other words, while these might be the first set of recommendations that this council adopts, they will by no means be the last. And more importantly, these recommendations that will be presented today are intentionally broad. Um, they can speak to a whole host of possible actions and steps and opportunities for real progress in a number of areas, both on a very minute scale, but also Gives, gives you as the council the opportunity to think as big as you want in the development of the national caregiving strategy. So the, and the specific actions or steps that will be undertaken or proposed under each of these, whether it's going to be at the federal or the state level um, or by health and long-term services providers, um, that, that process is going to come later next year when we begin building the national strategy. So for today, our work will focus just on adopting these recommendations. And further, I also want you know, council members to, to recognize that once this report goes into clearance next year, um, that some of the language that we have today may get tweaked a little bit. Um, as it goes through vetting and review. And, and to that end, you know, I just ask that the, to, the discussion today um, be viewed as the beginning of a dialogue in this regard and by no means a conclusion. Um, our approach that we're going to use today and that we've gone over with the council co-chairs will be to have each of the council co-chairs, so that's Dr. Alan Stevens, um, Nancy Murray, and Dr. Casey Schillam, introduce the goal or the priority area 
after which our subcommittee leads, uh, and our subcommittees are headed by James Murtha, James Cheeley, Carol Zerniel, and Dr. Um, Georges, will present the, the slate of recommendations under each goal. And there's as few as three or four on up to about nine or ten under each of the goals. Once all of the recommendations under the particular goal are read, uh, we'll have t some time for final discussion and review. Um, given the extensive amount of work that has occurred up to this point, though, um, we really don't anticipate that there would be much in the way of, of revisions or edits to be made at this point. Um, and we're going to work one goal at a time, um, taking a vote after each set of recommendations. And just remember that the voting process is for our non-federal partners only. And so we've allotted about 20 to 30 minutes for each goal. We're going to take a break after goal two, I think it is. Um, and Sarah Markell will be our timekeeper. So, council members, any questions before we begin? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and begin to turn things over to our council co-chairs and subcommittee leads to take us through each of the goals and present the council's recommendations under each. So, we're going to start with goal one. Um, and Nancy Murray, um, you're the co one of the co-chairs, and James Murtha and Carol Zerniel are co-subcommittee leads um, for this particular goal. So Nancy, uh, take it away. Thanks, Greg. I just wanted to say that um, I am a family caregiver. Uh, my husband and I have two adult children with uh, Down syndrome. So this, it, this means a lot to me both personally and professionally. And I think it is only fitting that we are going to be approving these recommendations during National Family Caregiver Month. So let's uh, let's get started. Um, our first priority area is creating more awareness and outreach for family caregivers. And our first goal, um, family caregivers, physical, emotional, and financial well-being uh, can be improved as a result of uh, expanded awareness, outreach, and education. And again, as a family member, I can tell you that this is something that uh, all family members across the United States continually need. Uh, the need for information and education never stops. So, um, Carol or James, do you want to start off with our first recommendation? Yeah, I'll begin. And uh, everyone listening, I'm James Murtha, one of the leads for subcommittee one. And I uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. I have a disability um, from par becoming paralyzed after a mountain biking accident. So I receive care. And so that's my perspective where I'm coming in from to the council. So to begin, recommendation one, one point one. Increase public awareness and recognition of the diverse needs, issues, and challenges family caregivers face and of the importance of recognizing and supporting them. Thank you, James. And, yep, and Carol, you can take one too. Thank you. I'm Carol Zerniel, uh, and I'm pleased to, to serve uh, on Committee 1, and I run a foundation that serves caregivers as well as being a family caregiver for my mother who recently passed away with Alzheimer's. So recommendation 1.2 speaks to the, the challenge of having caregivers recognize their role. Increase family caregiver self-identification is of an access to information, services, supports across a range of topics. And 1.3, improve outre outreach efforts to family caregivers to ensure early identification and access to services and supports. Next slide, please. 1.4, support the development or revision of state, territorial, tribal, and local planning that focuses specifically on recognizing, including, and supporting family caregivers of all ages and is aligned with the National Family Caregiving Strategy. And 1.5, promote the expansion and role of public and private partnerships at all levels that recognize, assist, include, 
support and engage family caregivers. So now I would ask uh, all of the council members. Now that you've heard all of the recommendations again, is there anything significant missing from any of these recommendations? We'd also like to add that all of the recommendations that you're going to hear this afternoon, they're all important. They're all priority recommendations. No one is more important than anyone else. But this is this is your opportunity. Are, did we miss anything when it comes to uh, more education and outreach for family caregivers? If not, then I would say we did a good job. Greg, I don't hear any any further ideas. Okay, well then I think what, what you, we could do, um, Chantal, if you could advance to the next slide. So for the non-federal council members, um, if you want to, um, we're going to pull up a poll uh, for the non-federal council members to vote. Uh, and the vote is, um, I, the vote reads, I, I vote to adopt recommendations under goal one as presented, and you select either yes or no. And we'll give it just a minute or so so that we can register all of the votes of the non-federal members. And then we'll take a look at the results. So Cheryl, whenever whenever you're whenever you think you've captured all the votes. Okay, it looks like we have. Is there a way to reopen the polling? I uh, the time said it was off before I got a chance to vote. Oh, Cheryl, can you reopen that? Sure. And this is only for the non-federal members of the council, only the non-federal members mm -hmm. to vote. And, and Greg, how many yeah. non-federal yeah. members are on the call today? They're, all 15 are here today. Okay. So we... If all 15 vote yes, then we should see a 15 there. Yes, right yes. now we have 18, so it looks like. A so I am asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will restart it and I will ask that all non federal members only take the poll. Thank you. I can't see the poll. It, it's in the chat polling box on off to the right. I can't. God, I can't see it. It's mm. it's it's not quite there yet, Carol. I don't see it yet either. Okay. There, it's not there yet. Hold on. She's resetting it. This is Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see it. It went away. Well, while we're waiting, uh, Carol and James and I really appreciated everybody um, who worked on this uh, one priority area and all of the all the hard work and the good discussions that we had. Yeah, I have I have to say, you know, listening into your discussions and your deliberations, um, it was really it was really heartening to to hear the robustness of the discussion. Um, 
and the thoughtfulness that went into these, really for all of these. Yeah, I second that. And, and thank you all for taking on leading the subcommittee. This is Ben. <laughs> okay, here's the here's the revote on goal one. Okay, we'll do a better job this time. <laughs> And can you walk is it, the answer just goes into the chat box. I'm sorry. I'm not saying a yet approved, not approved. I'm sorry. And then it's. Um, yeah, this is Lori. And the lower right by your chat box, there's 3 little dots. Mm -hmm. Click on those little dots and you'll see the word polling. And that will bring the poll up for you to respond to if it's not. Thank you. Mine says yeah. the poll has ended and I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not, I apologize. I'm just not seeing the buttons. Do you, did you see it in the dots? It says poll, it says polling. And then when I pull up polling, it opens and it says time lapsed and the poll has ended. Cheryl, have you? Close the poll. I don't think it's closed. It says the poll has ended. I will put that, it up again so that you mine can. also says the poll is ended, and I'm usually the slow one, Carol. So Thank you, James, you're making me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> like every time I open it, it says the poll is ended. Okay, Aha, okay. Now I see a question. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> I am showing that 14 people have finished and one is in progress. Well, that's our 15. Plus we had enough votes for the first two practice rounds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we have 45 yes, we now. I think we're yeah, right. We're, right. <laughs> we have at you. least 40 votes. <laughs> Thank you. And I did close earlier because I saw more than 15 people had voted. So now I see 16 have voted. So well, I am closing the poll now. Okay. So it looks like um, we hit that you all have voted to um, adopt the recommendations under goal one. So that is one down and four to go. So thank you. And we'll we'll get the hang of this as we keep moving. So we're going to move on to priority area goal number two. Um, and for that, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Schillam, um, one of our other co-chairs, and Dr. Georges to take us through uh, that goal and then the recommendations under that. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everyone. I am Casey Schillam, and I have um, multiple reasons for being involved in family caregiving work. Um, my practice has been in the care of older adults in um, uh, home health and chronic care management for older adults in assisted living and continuing care, as well as palliative care. And I also am a family caregiver to my father who was um, injured after a motorcycle accident. As well, I am the Dean of the largest school of nursing in the state of Oregon, and I have direct influence over the future nursing workforce. And we have um, not only um, chronic illness management, but we have palliative care, family caregiving, and um, all of those aspects of the importance of how health providers, and in particular nurses, need to be prepared in, in engaging with families as equal partners in their work. And so that brings us then to goal two, which is um, one of the ones why I am, that I am so passionate about. And also just incredibly grateful to the team who has worked on on this one in particular. So the priority area is the engagement of family caregivers as partners in healthcare and long term care services and supports. So goal two, um, and again, as Nancy stated, each of these priority areas and goals are equally as important. Um, so we just wanted to, we, we're trying to continue reiterating that component that there isn't necessarily one priority area or goal that is um, more important than the others. 
but um, we may have our own passions about which ones we think <laughs> that we are most drawn to. And this is definitely the one um, that, that I've been very passionate about. And the goal is that family caregivers are recognized, engaged, and supported as key partners with providers of healthcare and long-term services and supports. And with that introduction to the goal, I will turn it over to my um, dear colleague, Dr. Georges, and she will walk us through the actual recommendations. Catherine, are you on? Um, can you check and make sure that you're unmuted? Thank you, uh, Dr. Shil Shilam, uh, and I agree with everything that you've just said, also being a nurse and running a nursing program in the city of New York, but particularly I brought to this council my experience as a family caregiver having cared for my husband who had Parkinson, and also at the same time representing AARP, <laughs> the world's largest consumer group where a hallmark program in AARP is family caregiving. So I'm really pleased that these recommendations, I met some of the most brilliant people who are council members with passion, you know, in making sure this works. The recommendation 2.1, ensure the impact of policy and practices on family caregivers are studied and understood before changes are made in healthcare systems. 2.2, identify and include family caregivers as essential members and partners in the care recipient's care team. Recommendation 2.3, engage family caregivers through the use of evidence-supported and culturally sensitive family caregiver assessments to determine the willingness, ability, and needs of family caregivers to provide support. Next. Recommendation 2.4, increase the integration of care through the inclusion of family caregivers in all relevant care coordination and transitions across providers and settings, and when desired, by both caregiver and care recipient. Recommendation 2.5, strengthen the training of healthcare, social service, and allied professionals to maximize family caregiver engagement and referrals to services in the community. Thank you so much, Dr. Georges. And I, I definitely see um, your influence and mine in these recommendations, as well as, <laughs> as you mentioned, all of the amazing um, committee members who've worked on this specific goal. So um, our question is, um, is there anything that is missing, anything in this recommendation, the goal or the recommendation specifically that you feel um, is missing that we we haven't captured with what we've put into all five of these specific recommendations. Hi, uh, Casey. So, this is Alan Stevens. I I just want to commend the work of this subgroup and uh, and for your leadership. Dr. George's leadership, uh, very, very, very well done. Thank you for, Thank you. yes, and I absolutely appreciate Dr. George's leadership in this work too. Um, one of the other questions that we considered asking is, you know, we wanna also make sure, and Greg sent this out in, in our um, most recent communication is, have we really captured the, does the language, reflect the lifespan of caregivers, care recipients that we might be seeing as well. We wanted to also just ensure that we aren't focused on any one particular population or group with these recommendations, but rather that we're, we're capturing the full scope of um, all family caregiving that happens in our nation. And so 
um, with that, I would also just like to ask, do you feel um, that we've we've captured that and that we are really reflecting and representing the full scope and breadth of family caregiver? Casey, this is Nancy. I think that that's that's a global issue, and that you know, as our report is being written, um, you know, Sarah and Greg, who are who are taking the lead on that, that um, the the whole idea of lifespan needs to be woven throughout all of the all of the writing, not necessarily with with each and every recommendation, but. It, it's it's global. It needs to be woven in throughout the report. Yeah, really great point, Nancy. And mm -hmm. and from my review, I hadn't seen anything in particular that 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 reflected that we weren't capturing that in either goal one or goal two. And yes, that is that is the focus. That you know, as we be, as we are crafting the report and pulling it together. We are being very, very mindful of the lifespan approach, um, and that will be. I think that'll be very evident in the in the draft that we will provide to you all um, relatively soon to begin reviewing. Wonderful. This is James Cheely. Mm -hmm. I also noticed in the vignettes that Mike Whitkey put together, a couple of the people specifically pointed out caring for my family member for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's so key for their presentations as well. Yeah, it's such an important point, James. And we I really do you, appreciate it. Yes, Carol, go yeah. ahead. Thank you. No, I, I was I was had the same thought as James, and I think that's what's so important is that we're bringing the real life stories along with the recommendations so that people get that full picture. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember all of our conversations where we kept saying that we were hoping that we could have pictures of of actual family caregivers to help reflect what their stories are. And and now with this project, we're going to be able to have that. That's mm -hmm. going to be. I think it'll be very powerful on many levels and for many different audiences. Mm -hmm. So did we? So given yeah, given that I haven't. Any um, any feedback that um, indicates that that anyone feels that anything is missing? Can I um, ask for us to move forward for the vote for goal two? And again, this is for our non-federal partners only. Chantal, can you move the slide forward, please? Carol's shaking her head like she can't see the poll again. Yes, the time's clicking, but I see it. So things are improving. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Only James. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will be closing the poll. Great. Looks like looks like we have unanimous plus one. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. So excellent. So we have we have recommendations adopted under goal two. Now um, we had built in at this point. Um, we're we're actually making very very good progress. Uh, we had built in a little break at this point. Um, assuming that we were going to be about 30 to 40 minutes later in our agenda, 
do you all want to take a little break for five or ten minutes now, or do you just want to keep on working because we could move right into goal three? Keep going. Okay, then we will do keep that. Going. So um, priority area goal three, um, we will um, again hear from co-chairs um, Dr. Schillam and Dr. Stevens, um, and then from our subcommittee leads, um, Dr. Georges and James Cheeley. And so we've got quite a slate of recommendations under priority area three. So co-chairs, um, I will let you all kick off this discussion. Thank you, Greg. And so I will start us off with um, reviewing the larger goal here. And the priority area is for services and supports for family caregivers. And the goal reads family caregivers, fa excuse me, family caregiver has ac have access to an array of flexible person and family centered programs, ports, goods, and services that meet the diverse and dynamic needs of family caregivers and care recipients. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Georges and James to walk us through the specific recommendations. James and I will use the format that um, Carol and the other James use. So James Chile, you can start. Okay. Since everybody else has introduced themselves a little bit, I'll, I'll introduce myself as well. Uh, I'm basically a dad. Uh, I coordinate Special Olympics in our community, so th that makes me dad to 62 or so athletes here in our area. And uh, just means a lot to me to be involved in their lives. And, and as I introduced myself back in August of last year, I'm just waiting for everybody to call because they need some roofing work done at their house and nobody's called yet. So I guess the roofs must be holding up pretty well. So recommendation 3.1 is to increase access to meaningful and cultural relevant information, services, and supports for family caregivers. Recommendation 3.2, increase the availability of high quality setting appropriate and caregiver defined respite services to give caregivers a healthy and meaningful break from their responsibilities. Recommendation 3.3, .3, increase the availability of diverse counseling, training, peer support, and education opportunities for family caregivers, including evidence-informed interventions. Next slide, please. Expand caregiver support programs and services that maintain the health and independence of families by increasing access to housing, safe living accommodations, food and transportation, and by reducing social isolation. Recommendation 3.5, encourage use of technology solutions as a means of supporting family caregivers. Recommendation 3.6, expand the use of vetted volunteers and volunteerism as a means of supporting family caregivers. Next. Recommendation 3.7, improve the support of family caregivers during emergencies. Examples would be pandemics, natural and man-made disasters. Recommendation 3.8, increase the prevalence and use of future planning as a means for ensuring family members have the needed supports in place throughout the care recipient's life. Recommendation 3.9, increase and strengthen the paid long-term services and supports, LTSS, and direct support <laughs> workforce. Next slide, please. So that was, that was it. There was, there was nine recommendations under that goal. So right. that's, that's great. Uh, this is Alan Stevens, and I'll 
entertain questions or comments, discussion on these uh, recommendations. So, Alan, this is Carol Zerniel. I just wanted to thank the committee for including the language for person and family centered programs. I think it's so important to call both of those out because people will say, oh, we always mean person centered or we always mean family centered. But by explicitly saying it, it's, it's very important. I agree. Any other comments? I, I just have to say, and I, I know it, it, we had a lot of discussion, but I think the criticality of recommendation 3.9 uh, must be clearly defined because there are so many people who have to have someone else besides a family member and long-term, paid long-term care services and supporting the workforce is are such critical issues as the the, the population ages and needs change and family dynamics change. I agree and, and I would just add to that. And I, I think when we're reflecting back on the year that we've just been through, we can see how the, the pandemic has shaped our thinking. This is another one where we really have to think um, long and hard about how long-term services and support should be provided. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Greg, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, I think if we can move to the next slide and Cheryl, if you wanna pull up um, the, next, the next poll, this is for um, again, non-federal council members to vote on goal three recommendations. Your time starts now. Okay, it looks like we have 15 plus, so that's good. And I bet you Carol was the first one that voted, right? <laughs> okay, congratulations, guys. You you voted on goal three. Um, are we okay to move on to goal four? Yes. Okay, Nancy, take it away. Nancy, are you there? I am, and I'm reading right, right to myself without unmuting myself. Okay, I'll start again. So, uh, priority area four is the financial and workplace security for family caregivers. And goal four reads, family caregivers lifetime financial and employment security is protected and enhanced. James and Carol, do you want yeah. to read the recommendations, please? Yeah, next slide, please. Carol, you want to start it off? All right. So recommendation 4.1, decrease the negative financial impacts for family caregivers on both a short and a long-term basis. And 4.2, advance the development and broaden adoption of employee-centered flexible workplace policies and practices that support work-life balance and maintain performance while when personal circumstances change. Next slide. 4.3, increase the availability and use of financial education and planning tools for family caregivers. 
and 4.4. Improve the affordability of long-term services and supports and reduce out-of-pocket costs for families through public and private payers. Next slide. Uh, so Nancy, I guess any discussion on from any of the council members on any of these? Yeah, I was just going to ask, does anyone have uh, any significant changes to be made to any of these recommendations? Looks like we did another great job coming up with them. Greg, I think we can uh, take a vote. All right, go for it. So we'll pull up the next poll. Greg, this is Rhonda. Yes. And I and while we're taking this poll, I just want to congratulate everybody, but especially all of the support staff and the people who've done this, because we did a lot of nitpicking. <laughs> These are really, really well done. And I applaud all those who've worked on this so hard. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And right back at every one of you. This is this has been truly a, a wonderful process. So and it looks like we have a vote to adopt the recommendations under goal four. So way to go. So we're really cooking along here. So I, I'm thinking we could probably jump to goal five since there's only just a couple of recommendations under that one. And um, Alan, uh, Dr. Stevens, do you want to go ahead and kick off goal five discussion? Sure. Uh, in this comes under the priority area of research data and evidence-informed practices. Um, just uh, again, a little bit about myself. I've uh, spent a career doing research in uh, family giving, family caregiving, mostly around the area of, of dementia. Um, and it's just been a great pleasure to work with so <clears throat> with this group who represents such a diverse and important reflection of caregiving. Uh, it's been a just a pleasure and I look forward to the work that we continue to do. Uh, goal five stated family caregivers are engaged stakeholders in a national research and data gathering infrastructure that documents their experiences, translates evidence into best practices, develops person and family centered interventions, and measures progress towards the national family caregiver strategy. Recommendations, I think, are going to be read by James. Mr. Cheely, are you there? I'm here, reading to myself like Nancy, taking after <laughs> other people. Um, I, I think the first four recommendations had such meat to them of what we really want to put into place, and these this goal, these recommendations are the bones that are gonna make it last forever because it's gonna to put together the numbers that substantiate the work that we really wanna do. And uh, I know Alan seems like the research and numbers kind of guy and he just kept us on task to get this part done the right way. So recommendation 5.1 is establish a national infrastructure using standardized data, questions, and a definition of family caregiver for obtaining, analyzing, and disseminating information about caregivers and their experiences. Recommendation 5.2, increase family caregiver research that facilitates the development and delivery of programs and services that support and enhance the health and well being of the caregiver and care recipient. And recommendation 
increase the promotion, translation, and dissemination of promising and evidence-supported practices to support family caregivers in the delivery of health care and long-term services and supports. Thank you, James. Um, comments from, from the group about this set of recommendations or questions? I just wanted to add my congratulations to this team and James, I really appreciate that. That analogy that this is the way that this entire set of recommendations maintains sustainability and it, it is with that. Active engaged stakeholder approach that this is going to be able to continue on. So congratulations. This is really, really well developed. Uh, this is Teresa. I, I just have a minor, minor edit, um, a comma after obtaining. In which, which one? Which one? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 5.1. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll, we will make note of that copy edit. Yep. Thanks. I echo what Casey said. This is Gisela with Home Instead, and that was beautifully framed out, James, and the work of this group um, across the board with all five goals. Um, but I like the, the way you, you framed up the importance of the data and, and the sustainability. So thank you for that. This is Carol Zerniel. Um, I, a researcher once told me that the research gives us new knowledge. And so to all the points in, in the prior uh, recommendation, that it, it not only is sustainable, but this keeps us fresh. It's new knowledge every time we grow uh, and we create out of this data. And so thank you to this group for making that possible. Thank you, thank you for those great comments. And yes, so much good work across all of the goals and all of the recommendations. So I, I add my thanks to uh, the committee, but also to Greg, whole team there at ACL and then Ashby. Uh, you guys have put up a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did we, um, Alan, do you think we were ready to move this one to a vote? Um, uh, yeah, I'll just make a, uh, add to the other co-chairs uh, previous statements that we, we strongly believe these are five well integrated goals that the recommendations weave together um, the fabric that we really need to understand caregiving. Um, none of these are more important than the other, but collectively, um, I think they'll take us forward in a very positive way. Okay, and I see the, the poll for Goal five recommendations is up, so non-federal members. Non-federal council members. Non-federal council members, thanks. 15. Okay, and it looks like we had 15 of 15 vote yes to adopt them. We finally got it right. We did. <laughs> we did, and I think in record time, too. 36 seconds. Um, congratulations, you guys. Um, may I just say, nice work. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have a slate of, of recommendations that will be will be included now in the initial report to Congress. Um, anybody have any final thoughts or questions? I mean, we are really, really doing wonderfully in our time on this meeting, and so we don't have much after this, and so you all may actually get a couple hours of your day back, which will be great. But um, are there any last-minute thoughts? Over Greg, could I, yes. 
Greg, could somebody please send out the dates and times again for the listening sessions? Yes, we will do that. We will do that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Greg, Greg, I just wanted to also add in, there were a couple of questions that were posed in the chat and I didn't know if we would have a chance to be able to respond to those. Sure, let me, I can, we do have, we do have time for that. So the first question um, was around, will there be any public relations efforts by this group to gain widespread support for the recommendations um, in, and increase awareness of the RAISE Act and the Council um, to caregiving advocacy group. For example, um, this, the person who posed this question um, mentioned that um, they receive emails from Caring Across Generations and they recently mentioned that there are caregiving initiatives proposed by um, the President-elect uh, Joe Biden. However, in skimming her emails, I didn't notice any mention of Ray's work on a national strategy. Um, and she's ho she hopes that regardless of the administration, the caregiving advocacy groups will get behind um, your recommendations. And I would say that certainly that is our hope as well. Um, I can tell you that this work has um, very much been done um, in full co coordination with a number of the advocacy, quite a few of the advocacy groups um, related to family caregiving. So in addition to the to the incredible members of our Family Caregiving Advisory Council, the National Academy for State Health Policies project that's been funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation also has a faculty um, of advisors um, to their work, um, and they really do represent the who's who also in the, um, of the family caregiving world, both from a research practice and um, advocacy policy perspective. So we do have that. Um, as is typical with government, government-led activities such as this one, once the report gets ready to be released, there will be a, a, a public outreach um, and messaging around the report. Um, and then as we roll into the development of the National Caregiving Strategy, which will begin in earnest um, early next year, and I will, we're going to go over some timelines here in just a minute, um, but all of that will be part of the messaging that we do. And we're start, as you can see with our Caregiver Month campaign this year, we're already starting to build awareness of our work because of where we are in terms of the progress. So today's meeting really did represent, in, in my mind, a very high watermark in terms of an accomplishment for this council. Um, certainly when uh, we convened for the first time in August of 2019, um, I could not imagine this point now because we had so much work ahead of us at that point but i see what you all have accomplished um and i you know i think i speak on behalf of lance robertson um when i say that you you guys are absolutely amazing um and then the other question was um will the final report reflect the urgency for some categories of family caregivers particularly those who have been providing care for many years and providing extensive care um, all ADLs, for example, and can I express the need for immediate and retroactive financial supports for this category of family caregiver? Um, and I can say thank you for that input. Um, that is certainly something, all of the chat comments that are captured are captured and saved, and that information can will be made available to our council members as they begin working um, on the national strategy and as we will take that comment that you made and, and you know look through where the report is to see if we can um you know make sure that that's incorporated because i do know that that is a key issue is length of time um and the financial impacts of family caregiving so thank you for that comment um craig craig yeah. yes can i can i add a comment sure i, I please. think i think if uh anybody non-federal member people at large that are that are associated with this chat today if you looked across the board with people that are on this committee when we gathered in august of 2019 everybody wanted to do something to make a difference to mm -hmm. i guess get our hands dirty um and accomplish something and, and oftentimes people think of accomplish something as What's it going to do for me tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, because we're an instant society. I have learned so much that without this type of a 
recommendation for where do we go and how do we get there, then nothing will ever change. Right. And I don't think there's anybody here that feels like there's still enough being done yet. But what we're doing is getting us to where we need to be to really get something done. So we know where all those questions and comments come from. Let's get something done. But boy, have we done so much already through so many intelligent people that have shared great information. Yeah. Here, here. Thank you for that. Greg, this is Wendy uh, Fox yes. Rage with the uh, Ray's Family Caregiving Resource and Dissemination Center. And so building on um, James's comments, um, I also just today want to acknowledge what an incredible milestone this is. Um, that you voted in the recommendations that you've been working all so hard on for over a year. Um, you've worked hard, you've worked dig diligently. Um, what an amazing council, really just incredible, lovely, lovely people you are. And it's just been an honor for me and for um, my colleagues, or the staffers who've been behind this to work with all of you today and on this important work. Um, so thank you to the council members. Thank you to the public who's listening in and who've been listening into our meetings and the support, the incredible staff from Nashby, Greg and his whole team at ACL, the support of the John A. Hartford Foundation, Ronnie Snyder, Scott Bain, and really great jobs. Kudos to everyone. You did it. Yay. <laughs> and, you know, and we are by no means done. We are literally just starting so this is the this is the first we're, we're winding up one chapter of your work and we're big and we're looking ahead to the to the next chapter of your work which i think is a kind of a nice segue um to wrap up with if we can go to the next slide i want to talk a little bit with you all about um the next steps that we that we and but when i say we i mean um acl through lance's leadership but also in our in our collaboration with um, NASHP, um, we've begun to chart out some very immediate next steps that are going to be happening. And so I wanted to share that with you, the council members, but also uh, for those members of the public who are, who are to, you know, listening in so that you all have a sense of where things stand. So now that we have the, the recommendations voted, voted and adopted, this gives us a very, very clear roadmap now for how, where we need to go with completing the drafting of the initial report to Congress. And so that is, that work um, is going to continue through the rest of, of this month. Um, and I can't believe we're, we're half, more than halfway through the month of November already and into the next month. We are also, I, as the, as the designated federal official and the lead for this at ACL, we'll begin reviewing the report um, with key members of ACL's policy office, our front office staff, um, as well as sharing our, it around the agency with our various components um, at the Administration on Disabilities, the Center for Integrated Programs, our Office of Policy and Performance and Evaluation, to make sure that we're, we're hitting the right themes and we haven't forgotten anything. Um, and then, so that will, that will be, take place through the months what's left of November and into December, realizing that we have the holidays and all of that. There are um, no formal council activities scheduled for the month of December. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we kind of needed a month off. Um, so that's what we're going to do, but we're not taking a month off. Um, we're we're going to encourage the, the council members to um, tune into the stakeholder listening sessions that will be part of NASHP's work. We will resend the, that invitation to you so that you can have that to, to, to tune into. Um, and we may be in communication with you um, over various parts of the, of the work that I talked about, the, finalizing the initial draft of the report. If you can go to the next slide. So then as we look, here's a tentative schedule of um, what we're thinking about for meetings and related activities. Knowing that we have a lot to accomplish and we want to begin to get the report moving, we would like to convene you guys as a full council again in the month of January and we'll send out a, a doodle poll for the dates, probably one of the three dates that we typically hold for subcommittee meetings and we're going to have a very focused agenda for that meeting. 
We're going to look at a um, NASH people present their the Medicaid paper that they wrote, which that Medicaid paper, like the Medicare one you heard a couple of months ago, will form an integral component of the initial report to Congress. We're also going to have, by that time, a re be able to review with you um, the federal inventory of uh, inventory of federal programs and initiatives that support family caregivers. We want to show you where we are with that and what that looks like. And then we're going to have a report out from Community Catalyst um, on the listening sessions that take place in December, which will provide you as the council with a tremendous amount of information to begin carrying forward into your development of the strategy. And then what we're going to do at the end of that meeting is we're going to lay out a structure for you all to begin as the council, your review of the initial report to Congress, because by that point, we expect to have a draft ready for you to begin looking at. So then, for, so that will be in a January full council meeting, a lot to, a lot to cover then. In February, you'll go back to your subcommittee meeting, um, your subcommittees for meetings, and you'll, in your subcommittees, be able to walk through and really dig into sections of the report that you want to, can you go, thank you. Um, want to focus on, and you'll prepare and provide feedback to ACL and NASHP on, as the council, what you, you know, your thoughts on the report, where we need to make some edits and changes, and really, again, looking for holes in anything that you'd like to have included. So that's February, and then in March, we're, we're looking to have um, a full council meeting again, where we will do a final review and discussion of the report, and hopefully be able to take a vote from the non-federal members to move that initial report into the clearance process within HHS. Um, that's, I put tentative in italics because we're in a, in a, you know, in a very changeable environment right now. As we see it right now, we think this is doable. Um, as things, you know, move, progress over the next several weeks and, and next couple of months, um, we'll see where things, um, you know, where leadership is um, within ACL and how we can keep things moving. But this is our tentative work plan. And in, during the month of December, um, NASHP and ACL are going to put our, we're going to put our collective heads together and come up with a 2021 work plan that will get us to completion of the drafting of the national strategy um, with you guys. Um, and we're working on an approach that will really help facilitate that process for you guys to come up with the national strategy. Um, so that's our that's our thinking on December, January, February, and March. Um, any thoughts on on what we've got laid out for you? Any questions? Greg, Greg if you yeah. um, just curious about the the February timeline of reviewing mm -hmm. and the report and stuff, which makes mm -hmm. I asked want to ask the question. How how lengthy will this report be? <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are doing our absolute level best to keep it under a hundred pages. Um, now that so the way it's the way it's shaping up right now is that the 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 section that deals with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, will be executive summaries of those two commissioned pieces, the Center for Medicare Advocacy and Na the NASHP Medicaid paper that just came out the other day again. Um, so those will be heavily executive summaried within the body of the report, and then we will link out to the full documents. Um, the same thing goes with the analysis of the RFI. We're, we're heavily, heavily executive summarizing that so it's a it's probably longer than your typical executive summary but we are bringing that together um, in a way that will hopefully provide concise picture of what the rfi looked like and then we'll link out to it and the same thing with the caregiver vignettes um, so it, it, and then and the national inventory we're, we're because all of this will be posted online um, it gives us some flexibility in terms of how we present the report um, for length, and so it may very well be that it's more easily digestible um, this way. Well, yeah, we we're Thank very you, mindful. Madam. We're very we don't want to produce a tome, but yet we need to hit the high points, and we need to and we need to be responsive to what the Rays Act calls for in the report, which I think will will provide us with a, a very robust but also meaningful document as well. 
so then Greg, once mm -hmm. once we have the report, then mm -hmm. then how is it given to members of Congress? So it, it, it's it has according to the statute it has to be made available electronically um depending on resources you know we would we may be able to produce some hard copy but that would be a decision a little bit down the road um but it will it will definitely all reside electronically and in accessible it w it w everything would be 508 compliant and completely accessible this is Helen Gray. I can comment on that from our NAPA experience. So our, our reports go through the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Legislation. After they're cleared, um, there are letters to Congress, and then they used to physically walk the reports up to the Hill. Now they just send them. And so our um, staff liaison at ASL knows the um, contact person for each of the relevant members and committee chairs um, email addresses and they send them directly to them and copy us on that. So it's a pretty, it's not as nice as actually walking up a hard copy, but they get it very directly. Thank you, Helen. So so if, if a senator wanted to have a, would, would protocol be that if a senator wanted to hold a hearing on the report, would that, would, is that something that would happen or could happen? Helen, is that in your experience? Is that something that could happen? Uh, we have the Senate Aging Committee, Special Committee on Aging, has had hearings on Alzheimer's and dementia um, that have included components such as the national plan and the progress that we have made, but not wholly focused on just the plan and what's happening. You know, it's they're not trying to. I'm trying to think of the committee that would, you know, be like, why isn't this happening fast enough? Or why aren't you doing more? It's never been that sort of focus. It's um, uh, it's been a while now, but most recently it was um, like the chair of the advisory council talking about general awareness of the issues and challenges and then what the federal government is doing um, and then other witnesses talking about their experiences. In this case, I'm thinking of as a caregiver and for someone who was um, a provider. Twice we had our um, principal deputy assistant secretary um, testify about what the federal government was doing and how we were responding to um, the recommendations of the advisory council and, and the you know, challenges of dementia. Um, but it was never just focused on this. So I, I, you could have a hearing, but I think it would be a little bit broader than just the report. Thank you. Sure. So that's, uh, I'm, that's I'm our, sorry, Greg. Are, go for are, it. are we gonna be allowed to send a copy of the report directly to our senators? I, I, I believe that would be, I believe that would be acceptable, yes. Thank you. Have, Thank you. I'll have to get these some of these specific. Um, this is I'm learning some of this by the seat of my pants, so I will have to. But I, I'm pretty sure that that's would be permissible. And in the dementia and Alzheimer's space, sometimes advocacy groups have taken the recommendations and reformatted them, or made them really pretty, or picked one or two and used them for their advocacy days. So you, you know, it's all in the public domain. There's no reason that you or any of the right. groups watching um, this meeting today couldn't do the same with these recommendations. Exactly right. Yeah. So these these will be out in the public domain. So I guess one last question: mm -hmm. Does it, does this fall under aging or health and human services? So, the, the, the RAISE Act, I'd have to go, I can't remember the cognizant um, committee that oversees it, but it would be that committee in Congress, whether it was on the Senate, on the Senate side, um, that would have jurisdiction over this. And so I don't believe it's strictly aging and I, or, or disability, it's, it's more broad than that. And the um, Senate Special Committee on Aging doesn't have, I don't believe, has appropriating authority. Right, they do not. So that's just a consideration. 
Hi, Greg. Hi. This is Deb um, from Maui. Um, yeah. Part of the most recent reauthorization of the Older Americans Act allowed for the extension of this advisory committee. So mm -hmm. there, there is. The, yeah, there's. Yeah, there's a little connection there. Um, I think it was that I think it was just limited to extending the pushing out the sunset yeah. for this the same and it did the same for the grandparent legislation as well. Yeah. Bad one. Okay, uh, great. Go ahead. Jason. Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, well, thanks to everybody participating. Um, Nine council members. It's been great to see all the names of people joining. Thanks, Sharon Kavanaugh, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, I just wanted to leave one sentiment for all of us going forward. And it's been brought up, um, and both like directly and indirectly responded to by recommendations, particularly in goal three. But I just wanted to like share, you know, I, like with you know, it's on point relevant to where we're going through right now, but. You know, COVID's really like affected a lot of families and a lot of people who receive care. And part of what they're facing is some people are there's always there's been a caregiver shortage for you know a while now, and there's a growing caregiver shortage. But it's especially been problematic now for people who've not been able to get care. And you know, it's not something to address right here in this meeting, but for future meetings, both as counseling and subcommittees. Um, I know we've we've discussed it before, um, but I just want to reiterate that it's worth considering, like both you know in the case of COVID and also just in the case of other you know natural disasters, like whether it be you know other pandemics, hopefully not, but also hurricanes, like you know tornadoes, things like that, forest fires. So um, giving that attention um, to shaping our um, our ideas within the recommendations. Um, it's just one sentiment I wanted to leave the meeting on. Great, I think that's very timely. Somebody else was coming in with a comment? Uh, yeah, Greg's Alan. Um, just wanted to uh, add another group that I think should be thanked in, in this discussion, and that's uh, the people who helped get this legislation passed mm -hmm. to begin with, who were the, really the, the innovative, uh, creative thinkers who managed to get legislation through both the House and the Senate at a time when that doesn't always happen that easily. So yeah. I don't even know who they all are. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I know there were a lot of people who did uh, a lot of work and worked with congressional staff. So to those uh, those people who got the ball rolling and to the legislative staff offices who helped push it. Second that, and, and it's the Senate. The Senate. Committee. It's actually the, the cognizant um, committee in the Senate that has jurisdiction over raises. The Senate Help Committee, which is the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. So um, they would be the 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 one definitely the one committee who would be um, sent the report. But we would have the option to send it further than that. Thanks, Greg. Anything else for the good of the order today? Um, this has been an amazing, amazingly productive and rather exciting meeting, but I don't want to cut the discussion off. No, but we're past our break time. That's true. So we may, <laughs> then we may as well just break and call it a day, right? So Might as well. if, if there is nothing else, um, I, I want to just extend my my sincerest thank you to each one of you on the council for where you have gotten us to this point. This is truly remarkable. Um, we have so much to be thankful for um, this this year always, but, but this year in particular, and this is one of those things. So with that, I will say thank you to, you, to all of you. Um, we will be in reg very close communication with the council members regarding the next steps that I laid out for you in terms of getting the January and the March meetings on the books, um, as well as keeping you in the loop 
as to where we are with the development of the draft report and when that's going to be coming your way. So if there is nothing else, uh, we will we will end here with um, much gratitude um, and good wishes for a, a great holiday season. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy thank you. Enjoy Bye. the holidays. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to Nashby. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all.